Hollywood, son industrie du rêve, ses stars, ses millions de dollars et ses projecteurs toujours braqués sur les grosses machines. Nous avons décidé de mettre la lumière sur ceux que l'histoire a tendance à oublier, ces passionnés qui ont tout donné au cinéma sans que le cinéma ne le leur rende forcément. Pour ce faire, un questionnaire envoyé par email, un caméscope et tout le talent d'un homme qui s'est confié sans langue de bois. C'est l'histoire d'un acteur qui revient pour nous sur une carrière représentative de ce pan méconnu du cinéma. Ah, bonjour, my friends. It's me, Max Thayer. saw Harem Keeper to the oil sheiks. It was probably the worst thing that's ever been done. You underestimate my skill. I was 29 years old. I traveled around the world. I'd been in the army for three years. I'd done some theater. But I had absolutely no idea what I was doing and how I was doing it. And when they find out Will be too late. That wasn't my voice that they used. Here's the reason why. I was drunk. Oh, I was drunk. 22 hours on the set. No dressing room. Very little food. This was such a low budget movie that they, they would send out for fast food to feed people. Diane Thorne was nervous. We had a love scene to do. I had already been there 18 hours and shot some scenes. And she invited me to have some vodka and some more. By the time we shot, I was feeling pretty good, although I was still able to make my words come out. Then they asked me after that scene was over, it was about 10 o'clock at night when we started. We probably finished about 1.30. Would I mind sticking around so they could shoot some more scenes? It was a scene on the plane with the actor Richard Kennedy and myself when all the expository dialogue comes out about setting up the film. Three o'clock in the morning, I could no longer speak. I was so tired. So they decided to dub my voice. She was just a child, and the Sharif tortured her family to death. She's waited all these years for a chance to avenge them. And that is a true story of how Ilsa came about as far as my first effort in making a film. You ask about Planet of the Dinosaurs. The director was a man named Jim Shea. Probably did that film for the equivalent of about 65,000 American dollars. Maybe a little bit more with the with the stop uh, stop motion animation. Those guys really put a, a nice uh, planet of the di dinosaur fights together, and, and of course, uh, let me see. I believe I was eaten by a dinosaur in that one. Ah, it kills me. <laughs> Vasquez Rocks was, was mainly part of the location, very hot in the summertime. And the director's wife was the caterer on the set. She made the food. And the dressing room and the makeup and everything else was done in one motor home, which was also where the food was cooked. Uh, that was truly what you would call independent filmmaking. Uh, today, people talk about independent film. They got millions of dollars. This guy did this film for less than 100,000, I'm sure. 
Le début des années 80 marque un tournant dans la carrière de Max. Après quelques films aux états unis notamment les chiens de chasse de Elliot Hong, il s'envole vers les Philippines où il tiendra la vedette de plusieurs longs métrages. Il y vivra ses aventures les plus rocambolesques. We go to 1984 in the Philippines and a movie called Dead Ringer and I was asked to become these two characters. Instead of twins, one good, one evil, how can you refuse as an actor? I felt I was ready and uh, took the challenge. Alors j'ai kidnappé sa fille. Fille de Marlowe, c'est ça. Mm. Où est-elle <rire> oh ben, tu ferais mieux de te tirer avant qu'elle revienne avec de la compagnie. What an experience that was, as far as the stunts and the action and the things that went down. You would be arrested here in the United States for doing some of those stunts. With live ammunition was used in the scene in the car where I'm on top of it and my legs are rolling back and forth to the window. That's actually Nick Nicholson's legs. We just changed pants and shoes. And the person sitting in the car with the M16 put a real live round in and let the legs swing back and forth when it was clear. Boom! <laughs> I did actually did that. I rolled on the car. They played the camera faster than it was. They fast, they speed the film, they call it. But the car was going about, oh, I would say 12, 15 miles an hour. But I did a scene where uh, I have a guy and I throw him through a window, a, a glass door. That really was glass. I thought they were going to fix it up and make it candy, that they call candy glass. And uh, it was real glass, and the guy just went through it. Just incredible stuff that they did. The, uh, the stunt people in, in the Philippines, words can't say enough. The special effects people, well, special effects. The famous scene where there was a little mistake made was supposed to be a smoke grenade. It turned out to be a white phosphorus grenade. And, of course, it was, uh, it was actually very terrible for some of the people who got burned very badly. Uh, I just have a couple of marks here on my neck that were left when it went off. It was really wild to do that and to have survived it and been able to say that I did it. You can't take it away and I had a grand time. I want to talk about something that doesn't get talked about very much. Money. Being paid for what you're doing. Of course you love it. And as an artist, some of us would do it for free, but in order to be respected, to be professional, to make a living, you want to be paid. When you're a professional, your obligation is to deliver. You, your uniqueness is what's being paid for. And that's the key. You want to be paid. When I was younger, I always thought it was within reach. And what keeps me going now is the belief that it still is. No dead heroes shot mostly around Manila. Uh, Jim Cabrera was the director. For so little money that they had, what they worked with, I have never seen people who could do so much with so little. And the production values that you got on screen were just incredible. The crew that put those sets together, in the middle of the jungle, just incredible if you ever see the movie, those sets, and then they blew them up. I worked with dogs, tarantulas, 
snakes? Ah, the snake eating scene. Drinking the blood of the snake. Ooh, 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 ooh. Yes, as I recall, this happened in the jungles outside of Bangkok. Yun Kui was a director who knew what he wanted and knew how to get me to give it to him. He didn't speak very much English and was trying to explain to me about drinking the snake blood. We're going to shoot the snake at the moment when they take the blood into the glass. Then we stay on it, no cuts, dolly down to you, and you drink it. Hmm. Now this is interesting. People will understand and people that know will say that really happened. challenge as an actor, I love to do it, uh, I accepted it. And I washed it down with some uh, Sing beer, more than one, I'll tell you after that night, that was one take. I see there was Sworn to Justice, Martial Law, Undercover, two films I did with Cynthia Rothrock back here. Things got thin and weak, I did not have a lot of work. Eventually, I stopped working altogether for, oh, let's see, a period of about 96 to almost for about four years. It was very thin. Then I missed just the set so much, I went back to work as, as an extra. And I eventually ended up doing some very good featured work on some big films like Red Dragon, The Man Who Wasn't There with the Coen Brothers. I was also involved in doing some small theater, and doing, in doing so, um, one of my friends called me up after a play we had done and suggested I met with, uh, with Janet Wu, who was looking for someone to play a German industrialist. So I went and showed up and met with her. She said, uh, oh my gosh, you know, uh, you're perfect. Can you speak English with a German accent? Yeah, yeah, well, it's just no problem, I said. A week later, I was on the plane, and we shot CEO, which was the story of an industrial, Chinese industrialist, who brings China into the modern world of manufacturing. And then coming back, oh, it was a year or so later, I met with Derek Wan, the director of what was to become War of the Genes, a 26-episode TV special, TV series, to be shown exclusively on China Central TV. I get to play a villain who is responsible for a spread of a SARS-like disease that spreads in Los Angeles. Now, in summing it all up, in one sense you asked me, how about my life as an actor? Well, acting has led me on a journey. It's been like a magic carpet sometimes. And of course, sometimes it's not exactly what you thought it would be or what you expected. But every day I wake up, and I thank God for the adventures he's given me, for the life he's given me. And I look forward to each day. How would I describe myself? Maybe like a battered old car that keeps on going down the road. In a way, it's like I've been a character from some novel, living these adventures. It's been well worth it, and I've had a good time. I have no regrets. I'm glad to have done what I've done, 
in the end, I would like to think that at least whatever it's been, you've been entertained and it's been interesting. So now, my friends, I must say goodbye, au revoir. Ah, uh, let's see. Can I close with some French? Perhaps you'll let me know how my accent is. Combien je vous dois, s'il vous plaît? Allez-vous à Lyon? Champs-Élysées, Café au lait, Beaujolais, Chardonnay, Pouille-Fousse. Au revoir. And thank you for your interest. Oh, I don't. I, I, I wish it could have been better. You know, I, I, I have. This is my first experience of interviewing myself, as it were. But I'll close with this. You asked about sex, drugs, alcohol, all the stories. Well, mon frères, my lips are sealed. Those stories perhaps best remain untold. <laughs> ah, well. <laughs>